Good morning. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. I'm also excited to be continuing in our Corinthian series. This is where we are looking at the biblical books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, letters actually from Paul the Apostle to the church in Corinth, where they're having issues, so many that some have called them crazy. So we are asking the overlying question throughout the series, are we any different? We got our answer already to that. Before we begin, I want to draw your attention to our app if it hasn't been drawn there already. If you haven't downloaded the app, you should have been given a little instruction card, how to log on to our Wi-Fi C3 guest for free, download the app C3 Naples in the App Store. Uh, we're going to talk about it a little more later. Uh, it's like C3 Church in your pocket. You can pretty much do everything there except interact with real people. I don't know whether that's a good or bad thing, but <clears throat> anyway, you can follow along with my sermon. When I start with a sermon, I have this much information, and I have to get it down to that much information, so I put the other information in the app, along with different links to other resources for you guys. Check it out. Also, our Bible study questions. We have midweek Bible study upstairs in the ballroom, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Everyone is invited. Let's fill that room up. I lead that Bible study personally, but if you can't make it, that's okay. I won't take personal offense. You can look at the Bible study application questions, and you can go over with them when you get home, maybe. So we find ourselves in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Remember that there were overlying themes throughout several different chapters because the original letters did not have any numbers in them. <clears throat> that is distracting now. It would have been distracting then, but that's not the real reason. They're just letters to the church. And so Paul will cover different topics, 11 through 14. The topic, things in the worship service. So he talked about the spiritual gifts. We talked about love being the most important thing. Don't get caught up in your giftings and get full of yourself and boast. Now we're going to talk about order in the worship service. These contexts are really really, really important. A lot of people miss this. So everything we read here in chapter 14, we must keep that overlying context above everything else. That's how we get it right. It's also ignoring that context is how people get it wrong. Order in the worship service. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then is the conclusion, brothers? Whenever you come together, each one has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, another language, or an interpretation. All things must be done for edification. Edification is a fancy word for building up, building the body of Christ up, encouraging ultimately what? Love. Without love, it means nothing. It's for nothing. The first gift we're going to talk about this morning, I want to talk about two of the spiritual gifts here, and then I'll get to the main crux of what I want to speak about this morning. The first is prophecy. So here's what Paul says about it. 1 Corinthians 14.5. He says, I wish all of you spoke in other languages, some may say tongues, <clears throat> but even more that you prophesied. The person who prophesies is greater than the person who speaks in languages unless he interprets so that the church may be built up. But, Go back to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy and see what's said about prophecy. Deuteronomy 18.22, when a prophet speaks in the Lord's name and the message does not come true or is not fulfilled, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. So back in the Old Testament, the penalty for being a false prophet was death. And that might sound pretty strict, but think about it. That person says, I am speaking on behalf of God. That is a very serious thing. So if we listen to someone doing that, and they're false, that could lead to some really, really bad stuff. So it's very important. We don't want to go throwing that around. We don't want to just say, yes, I'm speaking on behalf of God. We want to test all things. It should be coming true. The next gift, languages or tongues. Now, I am using Holman Christian Standard Bible. That is what I used for 
for the book, the study guide, and I like to be consistent. I try not to hop around from version to version getting what I want. <laughs> so I'll stay in home and Christian, and I'm going to point out little variations here and there. They chose to use languages. Why do you suppose they did that? I'll tell you. <laughs> because from their interpretation, they're going back to Acts. They're going back to Acts chapter 2. And they're thinking, okay, what were the languages originally for? What was the point of these languages? A vehicle of the gospel. When the Holy Spirit came on them, they started speaking real languages. It mentions a whole bunch of people from places I can't pronounce. And they can understand them. They're like, what's going on here? <clears throat> it was for the gospel, the spread of the gospel. We also have angelic languages that is spoken about in the New Testament. But even if they are not regular languages that we can understand here, they must be interpreted. Paul is very, very clear about that. 1 Corinthians 14, 19. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding in order to teach you than 10,000 words in another language. 1 Corinthians 14, 23. Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all are speaking in other languages and people who are uninformed or unbelievers come in, they don't understand what's going on, will they not say that you're out of your minds? Right? So imagine that. We're all in here speaking languages people can't understand. These people are crazy in here. It's a concern for Paul. What is the context again? Order in the worship service. In fact, in Acts 2, they actually accuse them of being drunk. Peter has to address that. He's like, it's too early for that. We're not drunk yet. It's actually what he says. <laughs> so I guess that implies that if it were later, maybe they would have been drunk. I don't know. So God is not a God of confusion. Or is he? 1 Corinthians 14, 33, since God is not a God of disorder, but a God of peace. I want to just address this really quick because this is like a churchy saying that people say without understanding the context. Some versions say confusion. But that's not very good when we look at the full counsel of God's word. Who here knows the story of Babel, the Tower of Babel? Who knows what that comes from? Babel? Confusion it means confusion. So God did indeed confuse. In fact, what's kind of funny here is their languages in particular. That's what they did. He was worried they were going to accomplish everything and get full of themselves. So he confused, confounded their languages. So a lot of people will use this when a teaching is too complicated. And they want you to dumb it down. That's not the context here. In fact, you could look at the gift of languages as a reversal of what happened at the Tower of Babel. It's kind of interesting. Now we get to the tough stuff. Here's what I want to talk about for a little bit. Women speaking in church. I joke about this a lot, but, <laughs> but, but it's actually something that people take very seriously. So I want to look at the text. We're going to deal with it. And then I'm going to explain the text, the context, and the language. 1 Corinthians 14.33, As in all the churches of the saints, the women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church meeting. Should I just drop the mic and walk off the stage, or do you think I'll get in trouble when I get home? <laughs> I'll get in trouble when I get home. So let's look at the text, the context, and the Greek. I want you to notice something. When you look at this text, and just back up one more. Go back, yeah. Notice the word husbands. Did you notice that? Husbands. So, they should ask their husbands at home. See where I'm going? Who are those women? Wives. They're married women. It's not talking about all women in general. In fact, I'm going to teach you a little Greek if we go to that next slide, Gunaikis, those who understand Greek or New Testament Greek, modern Greek is a little different. New Testament Greek, you know, if you've studied that, the word for women and wives is the same. Same word, there's no different word. It is up to the translator to decide 
which one it is as we're reading it. So some translations, again, I used Holman Christian Standard to be consistent, but I could have pulled another translation and some of them would have said wives. Well, that would make sense because it says husbands. In fact, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, that little J next to it, that's a footnote. And the footnote reads, other manuscripts read, your women, your women. Something interesting. So whenever you see those two words, it's usually the same exact Greek word underneath it. Same thing with husbands and men. Andras, same thing. Just so we're not biased here. So that brings us to historical, cultural background. What's going on back then? Okay, even here in America, you go back, what, 70 years? Wives are very different 70 years ago. Even here in America. When did women get the right to vote? Heather? 1921. 1921. So what? Just under 100 years. We're going back in this letter 2,000 years. It's going to be a little different, isn't it? Not in America. This is ancient Rome. There are Greeks and Romans. So we can't think of a wife the same way we do a wife today as then. I told you when we got to chapter 5, how somebody, the guy in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, might have ended up sleeping with his stepmom. Gross. How might that, yeah, we're going to talk about a lot of gross stuff today. How might that have happened? I told you. Why? The mortality rate was really high. So, a husband might marry a younger wife. They would marry a younger wife anyway. So we need to think of them more like teenage girls. So what happened? The husband's older, so older marriages wouldn't be as common back then. The husband might have been twice her age. He might have been 30, she might have been 15. So if the husband had a teenage son from the first marriage, you can put two and two together, you get a couple teenagers living in a house together. That's what happens. Additionally, they weren't educated like women of today. Heather talked about it in her message that I'll point to later. It wasn't long ago <laughs> that women could do things like get credit cards, apply for mortgages. My wife has a master's degree. She has a job. She can support herself. This was not the case back then in most cases. So they're different. They're not educated. So you would have a situation possibly where the wives are chattering. They're asking questions, which is why Paul says, ask your husband at home. Do you see the context? Ask your husbands what? They're talking in the worship service. Again, what is the context? Order in the worship service. Wives, if you have questions, ask at home. Next thing. We have to look not just as, at what is said, but what they did. Does it match? Sometimes what is said is not meant to be taken literally. What I'm going to say next, if you took it out of context and put it on the internet, I would get flamed. <laughs> I would get destroyed. What if I said to you, <laughs> we should not always do exactly what Jesus said? Sounds controversial, doesn't it? Controversial. What if I said that? We should not always do exactly what Jesus said. You're all quiet, like it's a trick question. Now, do some examples. Everyone's like, all right, we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount. If you don't know what that is, it's in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, one continuous flow of Jesus talking. And I'll give you some examples here. Matthew 6, starting at verse 5, important word. Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. I assure you, they've got their reward. But when you pray... <clears throat> Go into your private room, some instructions here, shut your door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees you in secret will reward you. Huh. So, should we never pray in public? Should we never pray in a church setting? It says whenever. Are we actually sinning and being disobedient to Jesus when we pray here in church instead of in secret in our bedroom? What it says. No? Well, how do we know? Look at what Jesus 
did almost immediately after saying that, we have the Lord's Prayer. It's hard to say in this version when you do it the old churchy way, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our passes or debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and do not bring us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. Right after saying, but when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your father who is in secret, he immediately then prays in public. Okay. And for all of Christian history, nobody disputes that. We say that prayer all the time in public, not just in our bedroom. So we can see that what Jesus says to do is different than what he did or what we actually do. Why? At the beginning of the series, I went over literary devices that are very important. In my opinion, hyperbole is the most important thing to understand, to get this stuff right. It is an overflow. In Greek, think of it as hyperbole, a hyperthrow, an overthrow of something. It's an exaggerated statement to draw your attention to the point. What was the point? Don't be like the hypocrites and the Pharisees and all these people that are just want to be heard, lofty prayers, that's the point. It's not literally always do it only in your room. Hyperbole. Here's my very favorite one. It's also in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Just think about that for a moment. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin... Cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown in the hell. Did Jesus really mean for us to do that? Nobody say yes. Please don't do that to me. <clears throat> no! Otherwise, we wouldn't have our hands and the eyes. None of us wouldn't have them. <laughs> so how do we know? It's get confusing now. You're like, wait a minute. How do I know? What do I do? What is supposed to be taken literally? We look at what people did. We read the whole thing. Matthew 6, 19, also in the Sermon of the Mount, on the Mount. Don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But collect for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This one is more literal. How do we know? Look at what Jesus did. Matthew 8, 20. Jesus told him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. Jesus has his hands, feet, and eyes, but no place to rest his head. There are many teachings about it. We kind of know Jesus wandered around and didn't really care too much about money. We look at what he did. So we know, back to 1 Corinthians 14, we know what is said said about women or wives. There are two places in the New Testament specifically about that that make that statement. The other one is 1 Timothy. If you look in the study guide, I cover it in full, in great detail. In both instances, the immediate context is husbands and wives. But what did the women do in the New Testament? Well, <clears throat> what Paul actually meant by what we observe Women doing, by Paul's own instruction. Back in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since that is one and the same as having her head shaved. What are the women doing? They're praying and prophesying. Where? In the church worship service. <clears throat> That's the context. Remember, they had to wear the head coverings. Why? because some of the men might get turned on. It was weird in more conservative cultures not to have your head covered. So he says to them, cover your hair. When? You're out front, and they're all watching you. Remember the picture of the triclinium? So they're seated around watching the woman pray or prophesy. Prophesying, speaking on behalf of God. <laughs> kind of important. Paul goes on to write about equality in the Lord. A lot of people miss this verse. 
1 Corinthians 11, 11. In the Lord, however, right, so there's a contrast. He's talking about male and females, relationships between them, not covering your head if you're a man, covering your head if you're a woman. These are all natural human things. But in the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, and man is not independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through woman, and all things come from God. Maybe you've heard this one, Galatians 3.28. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Remember the gift of languages I mentioned in Acts. Well, Peter deals with that. And before he preaches Jesus to them, he quotes from Joel, one of the prophets in the Old Testament. He says this, Acts 2.17. In the last days, be God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons, and who else? Your daughters shall prophesy. Again, we have to look at what women did in the biblical church, not just what might have been said about them or our perception about what was said about wives, not all women, taken out of context. So I'm going to talk a tiny bit about the roles of women that we see in the New Testament. But I'm not going to go too far with it because my wife Heather already covered that in great detail, did a wonderful job. I am going to point to it. It's in the app. There's a link to the video of it and then also a link to a whole bunch exhaustive notes that no one could argue with us. I want to talk about Phoebe and Priscilla. Feel free to argue. It's okay. Just do it in your private room where your father sees you in secret. <coughs> Romans 16.1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant, a deacon of the church in King Creed. So you should welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever matter she may require your help. For indeed, she has been a benefactor of many and of me also. Again, Holman Christian Standard for consistency, but it gives a footnote there. It says deacon. Some translations say deacon, which is more consistent with the biblical Greek. <clears throat> the original Greek says diakonon, deacon. Phoebe is a deacon. A deacon is one of those three offices I told you about a while back. Seer, elder, deacon. It's an important job. Clear. She is in church and giving instruction to both women and men. As a deliverer of the letter to the Romans, this is a huge responsibility for a lot of reasons. One, it's Holy Spirit-inspired texts that she's traveling with, often dangerous journeys. Two, it's really, really expensive. A copy of Romans back then probably cost around, in today's money, $3,000 to make one copy. Paper was really, really expensive. Papyrus back then. They didn't have books like we did. They'd be on scrolls, right? Critical role. Also, notice what it says about her. She's going to give instructions. If you look carefully and you pay attention to names, the end parts usually, at beginning and end of Paul's letters, you find names of people and you'll give certain instructions. So she would have been called upon perhaps interpret or explain things in the letter. Check this out. Colossians 4, 7. Tychicus, our dearly loved brother, faithful servant and fellow slave in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know how we are, and so that he may encourage your hearts. So the deliverer of the letter will explain other things. Maybe that Paul doesn't have the paper to write on. We continue in Romans 16.3. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life. Not only do I thank them, but so do all the Gentile churches. If you've been through this series, you'll remember the eloquent Apollos, that great speaker that they're kind of going wild for. The Corinthians are loving him. And Paul's like, come on. <laughs> Not about Paul, Peter, or Apollos. It's about Jesus, people. Well, Turns out, Priscilla taught him. If we look at that, we see a few things. In the beginning, church in Corinth, the formation of that, and we get introduced to Aquila, Priscilla, and Apollos, a Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man who was powerful in the use of the scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught the things about Jesus accurately, although he knew only John's baptism. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. 
after Priscilla and Aquila, what's weird about that? After who? Priscilla, the woman first, and Aquila. You ever see a wedding invitation? Even now in the 2000s, it's always the man's name first, unless you're a very dominant woman. After Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him home and explained the way of God to him more accurately. Interesting. When he wanted to cross over to Achaia, the brothers wrote to the disciples, urging them to welcome him. After he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. Interesting. A lot of you are reading through Luke. Maybe not, maybe. I heard, I heard, I heard about this. It's like a, a biblical advent calendar, 24 chapters. People are reading a chapter a day. Maybe you're in chapter 15. I don't know. Maybe that was just one person. I heard about it. Anyway, it brought to mind this, Luke. Luke is an interesting gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Third one in order in our New Testament. Now, if you're reading through it, you've probably noticed something. Luke talks a lot about women, a lot. A lot about women in ministry. Go back to the beginning. It starts out like that, doesn't it? Matthew starts out with the genealogy. Luke is different. Talks about Elizabeth and Mary, Anna the prophetess. Go back and read it. Count how many times it talks about the Holy Spirit. Hmm, that was before Pentecost. Yes, it was. The Holy Spirit. Very operative in people. Men and women, right in the very beginning. That is interesting. So, let's follow some logic. If a woman is filled with the Holy Spirit, who is God, and speaking, who are we telling to shut up when we say a woman can't speak in church. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to be the one to tell God to shut up in church. I'll just play it on the safe side. There's another Christmas story in Matthew. Matthew is very interesting. But before we get there, it's not Three Kings, people. Mm -mm, Three gifts. So stop singing We Three Kings. We don't do that song. Theologically inaccurate. (laughs) Before we get there, there's a genealogy right out the gate from Abraham all the way to Joseph. Read it carefully, and you might notice something. Four, four of them. Four women who are undesirable. It's actually quite interesting. So, we're going to skip some of the gross stuff, but Tamar or Tamar, she's funny. This woman, in Jesus' genealogy, decided to disguise herself as a prostitute to trick her father-in-law into sleeping with her. Seriously? Yes. Yep. That's a part of Jesus' genealogy. Oh, we go a little way up the family tree and we get another woman who is actually a prostitute, Rahab. You know the story about Jericho? They send out the spies, scope it all out. It's actually, they talk about a land, and it sounds like a bad word, so I'm not going to say it. Anyway, (laughs) the spies go to scope it out. Rahab, they're looking for him, hides him on the roof. Rahab is a prostitute. Continues. On and on. Solomon and her have Boaz. Boaz redeems Ruth. Heard of Ruth? Ruth is a Moabite. Says in Deuteronomy, you're not supposed to intermarry with anyone else. Oops. They happen to do that an awful lot anyway. Ruth. They have Obed. Obed has Jesse. Jesse has King David. King David has Solomon with Bathsheba. Except Matthew doesn't mention her name. Just whose wife she is, not David, Uriah. Okie dokie, artichokie, we have 
someone playing a prostitute, sleeping with her father-in-law, a real prostitute, unbelievable, a foreign woman, no bueno for the Israelites, and an adulteress, all in Jesus' family tree. That's remarkable. Think about it. If you were going to make a story up, would you put these people in there? I wouldn't. I'd leave them out even if I was telling the truth. <laughs> Crazy people. Man, it's like MMA, uh, M, what's it? M-A-L-V. There you go. Not MMA, that's what I used to do. So it speaks of a story of redemption. Think about it. What is the, the point of Ruth? She's redeemed. The story of redemption. Here it is, people. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, really, seriously, <laughs> no matter what you've done, you are welcomed into this family. All of us. Through Jesus Christ, you are holy, righteous, and redeemed. That's the point. We ought not miss it when we're looking at these genealogies, when we're looking at these stories. So I want to give you an invitation. I'll be talking about it over the next couple of weeks. I was talking about it last week to the beach service, Christmas Eve. That is the 24th, 4.45 p.m., Vanderbilt Beach. If you are not yet a part of the family, I welcome you to come and get baptized and be a part of it. Everyone is welcome. Another invitation. We like to eat, so we have a potluck after church service. I invite you all to stay and be fed. This season is about meeting needs. We should be meeting needs. We do that all the time here at C3 Church, but things get rough. I described to you, it gets rough for people during the holiday season, doesn't it? Family, all this stuff, we're spending all kinds of money we probably shouldn't be spending that we don't have. It gets stressful. People pressuring us, kids in their Christmas lists, right? You don't circle catalogs anymore, though. They just type you emails. I don't know what they do like that with their thumbs. It's stressful. We're very tightly wound. It seems like all of a sudden all these bad things happen to everybody. It just seems that way. Is it just me or are we feeling it? Why, when I just spent all my money, did that happen? Ugh gets crazy. So this week, I had a plan. <laughs> it always starts that way, with a plan. I was going to mention three or four specific needs that we have. Then we got like three or four more. <laughs> and I got to this point and realized it would be quite laborious to go through all of the different needs our people have. Can do it. I'm not strong enough to stand up here and detail all of them for you. Just being real. It's a bit much. It was one of those weeks. Why God? Why? But I'm in prayer for every single one of you, and I want to give you the opportunity, the invitation to help, to be the hands and feet. Many of you are already stepping up to the plate. Thank you. We do have some monetary needs. There are some people going through some stuff. So I'm just going to encourage you to, in addition to your regular giving, if you have more to give, if that's the position you find yourself in and you're on the other side of it, I would encourage you just to give. It would help us out. One of the worst things about being a pastor is saying no. You get somebody on the phone, somebody across from your desk, they call the office, and the money's just not there to help them. And I got to look at them and say no. So, you want to help your pastor? That would help me out a little bit. I could say yes a little more, especially during this season. There are people that don't have it so easy, and unfortunately, they are in our midst. But we love them. We are praying for them. And it is my goal to support each and every one of them. Amen? God bless you. Thank you.